my name is Pietro Orlandi. Five years ago, I walked this same path through the Vatican's St. Peter's Square, surrounded by 200,000 joyful worshipers. It was March 18th, 2013, the day of Pope Francis's inauguration. Devoted followers from around the world celebrated their faith and the man who would guide us towards a bright future. I should have been there with my sister Emanuela. Instead, I was alone, looking to our new pope for answers. Seeing me, the head of security whispered a message. Then Pope Francis assured me, your sister is in heaven. I was touched and stunned. How did the Pope know my sister was dead? I have been trying to unravel the mystery of my sister's fate for the past 35 years. To do so, I need to start at the beginning. Emanuela and I, along with our three sisters, were born and raised in Vatican City, the world's smallest state, and home to only 444 citizens. It was like living in a village with the Pope as our beloved protector. Inside its walls, my sisters and I felt safe. My father worked at the Vatican Prefecture, where he oversaw all private audiences with Pope Paul VI, Pope John Paul I, and Pope John Paul II. Throughout his tenure, he was loyal and devoted. We were honored to meet with John Paul II many times, as he felt a responsibility to commune with the families in residence. Emanuela was happy here, posing with the Pope, even though she was embarrassed by her large glasses. Despite our eight-year age difference, we were always close. And I watched with pride as she pursued her passion for music. But our peaceful world inside the Vatican walls would soon be shattered. On May 13th, 1981, Pope John Paul II was passing through an adoring crowd of supporters when the piercing crack of gunshots rang out. The Pope was struck four times and would fight for his life. As doctors worked to save him, we were left to grapple with agonizing new questions. How could something like this happen to the Pope? Who could want him dead? The answers would become inextricably linked to the tragedy that struck my family two years later. June 22nd, 1983 was a very hot day. Emanuela, then 15, wanted me to take her to the music school but my girlfriend had already asked me to drive her to the university and complained that I usually favored my little sister. I decided that this time, I would leave Emanuela go to her lessons alone. She became angry and we argued. I refused to change my mind and she stormed out, alone.
Later that afternoon, Emanuela called home and spoke with our sister, Frederica. She said that on her way to the music school, a man had stopped her to offer a great job distributing promotional materials for Avon. La cosa che mi ha lasciato molto perplessa è innanzitutto il compenso che era sui 350.000 lire, un po' tanto per per una giornata di lavoro, specie insomma una ragazzina così giovane. Emanuela left school and walked along Corso Rinascimento to the bus stop in front of the Senate building. One of the last people to see her was her classmate, Maria Grazia Cassini. Quel pomeriggio, Manuela si rivolse a me e mi chiese a che ora finisse la lezione di canto corale, perché lei aveva un impegno. Stabilito ciò, praticamente, lei scappò via. Non ti disse che Finita tu eri No, assolutamente. Guardava l'orologio e diceva che doveva andare via perché aveva un appuntamento. Infatti io la rincontrai alla fermata dell'autobus. Arrivato l'autobus, sono salita con i miei compagni di scuola e me ne sono andata. Emanuela should have been on her way home, but she stayed behind, presumably to meet the man who'd offered her the Avon job. My elder sister Natalina remembers that night like it was yesterday. In testa sono rientrata la sera dopo le 8 a casa perché ho lavorato tutto il giorno e ho trovato solo mia madre disperata che Emanuela non era rientrata. Andatela a cercare e le sarà successo un incidente. That night nobody slept. As my family prayed for Emanuela's return, I searched the streets. At dawn, Natalina went to the authorities to file a missing persons report. La polizia ha voluto le foto, hanno eh così lo diciamo ai nostri colleghi in giro. Sarà andata a mangiare una pizza, la solita scappatella. Without police support, we took matters into our own hands. Printing hundreds of posters, and Rome awoke to Emanuela's face plastered throughout its streets. Over the next 10 days, police continued to ignore the case until a shocking message confirmed that someone in power was taking my sister's fate seriously. Desidero esprimere la viva partecipazione con cui sono vicino alla famiglia Orlandi, la quale è nella prigione per la figlia Emanuela di 15 anni che da mercoledì 22 giugno non ha fatto ritorno a casa. Condivido le ansie e l'angosciosa trepidazione dei genitori, non perdendo la speranza nel senso di umanità di chi abbia responsabilità di questo caso. The Pope's words took us by surprise. They referenced information that we, Emanuele's family, didn't have. He spoke of those responsible. He implied that Emanuela had been kidnapped. This was an astonishing revelation. But why hadn't the police told us this? And what else might the Pope know about Emanuela's whereabouts? As we struggled to understand, the Pope's statement also made waves in the media. Andrea Purgatori is a journalist who followed the story of my sister's disappearance for the last 35 years. And I hoped he could shed some new light on the case. Secondo te l'appello del Papa, dove c'è stato il 3 luglio, che cosa voleva comunicare al mondo? No beh, un appello naturalmente rivolto a chi doveva capire, a chi doveva riceverlo. Il Papa non è che parla a caso. Il Papa quando parla, parla perché ha una necessità di comunicare qualcosa 
e siccome non fa appelli tutti i giorni, se lo fa, evidentemente sta mandando un messaggio a qualcuno. It seemed likely that as the Pope shared his message with the public, he was hiding key information about my sister's disappearance. But why? The Pope's words may have been intended for Emmanuel's kidnappers, but they also moved a local traffic patrolman to come forward with an important tip about the day my sister went missing. The witness worked with police to create a composite sketch of the man believed to have kidnapped Emanuela. Who is this man? Thirteen days after my sister disappeared, my father received a shocking phone call. Pronto? Lei volti bene, abbiamo pochi momenti. Questa è essere della sua figliola. Pronto? Convinto la signora di fare una male di bambini. Dovrei fare il testo di sé a Pronto? 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 Sì, ma mi faccia una proposta almeno, no? Sì? Il funzionario del Vaticano sì? non mancheranno di mettersi in contatto eh, con lei. Sì, ma la bambina sta bene, mi dica almeno, no? Non preoccupe, io non potrei ora avanzare eh, a parlare. Al più presto possibile, altrimenti mi, mi fate morire mia moglie e io stesso. Buongiorno a lei. Grazie. The kidnapper's call gave us new hope. Hope that swelled when we learned that they had also called the Vatican press room. Police in Rome had been treating it as a tragic but more or less routine kidnapping of a young girl. But then today, Richard Roth reports, a phone call changed all that. An editor at the Italian news agency Ansa who took the call said the voice was that of a nervous young man with a startling claim. We have Emanuela Orlandi. We will free her only when Mehmed Ali Aja, the papal attacker, is freed. Aja is serving a life sentence for shooting the Pope two years ago. Investigators here are now trying to find out whether the Vatican's first kidnapping in modern times may also provide clues to the attempted assassination here two years ago of Pope John Paul. The kidnappers gave authorities only 14 days to secure Ali Aga's release. They also said that a basket in a public square near Parliament contained proof that Emanuela was indeed in their possession. When the police located the basket, they found photocopies of my sister's music school ID, a receipt and a note in her handwriting. But how could the attempted assassination of the Pope be related to Emanuela's disappearance? Three days before the July 20th deadline, Pope John Paul II made another public plea to the kidnappers. Standing outside his window in front of thousands of people for the whole world to see. Never before had a pope been so outspoken about a civilian crime. Per parte mia posso assicurare che si sta cercando di fare quanto è umanamente possibile per contribuire alla felice soluzione della dolorosa vicenda.
In Rome today, after Pope John Paul pleaded for the life of 15-year-old Emmanuel Orlande, her alleged kidnappers released a tape recording of a woman crying out in pain. <laughs> At times, I was sure I could make out Emanuela's voice. But since no male voices could be heard, I knew the recording had been edited. I would later obtain a confidential file from the Secret Service that contained the original transcript. Here were the missing male voices. Servizio per le informazioni e la sicurezza democratica SISDE. Dall'ascolto del nastro si è tratta l'impressione che il soggetto passivo di sesso femminile sia stato sottoposto a sevizie presumibilmente di carattere sessuale, da almeno tre persone di seguito. A voce di ragazza, B voci di sottofondo maschile. Why would such important evidence be edited out by the Secret Service? And more importantly, who were these men? The same day they sent the recording, the kidnappers demanded a direct phone line to discuss my sister's release. But they weren't talking to the police. They wanted to negotiate with the Vatican. Intanto la sala stampa della Santa Sede a Diramanto aveva fatto poco fa il seguente comunicato. In merito alla richiesta da parte dei rapitori di Emanuele Orlandi di una linea telefonica diretta, si notifica. La linea telefonica è stata installata. Il relativo numero è 6985, 6985, al quale va aggiunto il codice indicato. Cardinal Agostino Casaroli was the Vatican's Secretary of State and renowned for his skillful diplomacy in international matters. But the recording stops when Cardinal Casaroli takes the call. To this day, the Vatican refuses to reveal what was said between their Secretary of State and the men who kidnapped my sister. Che idea ti sei fatto? Il telefonista, quello che chiese è la linea diretta con la Segreteria di Stato che poi alla fine ottenne. Ma intanto non solo ottenne la linea telefonica, ma come ci fu il primo contatto diretto con Casaroli, perché questo è quello che mi dissero, chiese formalmente allo Stato italiano e quindi alla polizia, ai servizi segreti italiani, di fare un passo indietro, cosa che loro fecero. The deadline to release Aliaga and potentially save my sister was only three days away. So why were the police removing themselves from the negotiations? Why were they letting the Vatican do their job? Si fa sempre più drammatica e resta più che mai misteriosa la vicenda di Emanuele Orlandi. Questa sera scade l'ultimatum. Se non sarà liberato Ali Akja, la ragazza sarà uccisa. The July 20th deadline came and went. Aliaga remained in prison and the kidnappers went silent. 
We had no idea if Emanuela was dead or alive. Throughout this ordeal, my father remained faithful in his work for John Paul II. They spoke on a daily basis, but never of my sister's disappearance. It would have been deemed disrespectful for an employee to question the Pope. And despite my family's agony, the Pope never volunteered any new information. Driven by sheer desperation, my father took action, making a candid plea to the kidnappers. Messaggio di Ercole Orlandi per i rapitori della figlia Emanuela. Io, il padre di Emanuela ed interprete del pensiero, delle sensazioni, del turbamento profondo e incommensurabile, dolore di mia moglie, ho deciso di rispondervi personalmente e direttamente. Noi, padre e madre di Emanuela, abbiamo il diritto di chiedere a voi una precisa risposta. Se Emanuela è ancora viva, provatelo. Se la cara naturata Emanuela è morta, indicateci il luogo dove trovare la nostra Emanuela, perché in ginocchio noi si possa pregare per lei vicino a lei. By Christmas Eve, Emanuela had been missing for six months. With no new evidence or contact from the kidnappers, we were alone with our worst fears. But a surprise visit pulled us out of our despair. Pope John Paul II shed new light into the dark mystery of Emanuela's fate. He said there were two types of terrorism, national and international. Our loss, he said, was caused by international terrorism, and he would do everything in his power to bring Emanuela home. My mother and father were overcome with gratitude for the Pope who had not given up on finding my sister alive. His words renewed our confidence in the Vatican state authorities. During this same visit, John Paul II unexpectedly offered me a job at the Vatican Bank. As a 23-year-old with no relevant experience, I was delighted. But I would come to wonder, was the Pope simply trying to comfort us? Why did he blame international terrorism? What else did he know? And why wouldn't he tell us? Over 20 years would pass without any new leads into Emanuela's disappearance. The Pope's promise to my family was a distant memory. My father had devoted his life to the Vatican and to the three popes he served. But by the time of his death in 2004, he had lost all confidence in the Catholic Church. With his last breath, he lamented, I have been betrayed by whom I served faithfully. Soon after, in April of 2005, Pope John Paul II fell ill slipped into a coma and passed away. I had always believed that the Pope would one day share the truth about my sister. But that hope died along with him. His last wishes confirmed. Non lascio dietro di me alcuna proprietà di cui sia necessario disporre. Quanto alle cose di uso quotidiano che mi serviranno, chiedo di distribuirle come apparirà opportuno. Gli appunti personali siano bruciati. With those final words, 
we were sure that he had taken the secret of my sister's disappearance to the grave. But a year later, I learned that Pope John Paul II had appointed Don Stanislaw, a longtime and influential aide, to carry out his final requests. And that Stanislaw had defied the Pope's wishes. He declared, I did not burn them. They were too important. I called the John Paul II Foundation for over a decade, hoping to be granted access to the personal notes that Don Stanislaw kept. But every request was denied. Maybe today, in 2017, the answer would be different. Sì, pronto? Pronto? Mi chiamo Pietro Orlandi. Non so se se ricorda, sono il fratello di quella ragazza scomparsa, Emanuela Orlandi, nel 1900. Ah, sì, sì. Ah, sì, sì. E niente, siccome sto facendo delle continue ricerche, eh, sapevo che lì da voi c'era studiata la documentazione di Giovanni Paolo II. Vuoi sapere se era possibile eh, consultarla? Può venire direttamente. E quindi posso chiedere di lei, com'è il suo nome? Mi chiamo Padre Andrea. Padre Andrea, va benissimo, grazie mille. A presto allora. Prego, prego. Grazie. Prego, arrivederci. Allora. After 34 years of questions, I was ready to get some answers from John Paul II. Prego, scendiamo. Era in giugno, no? Sì. E così, giorno per giorno, si preparavano per Giovanni Paolo II. I searched for hours, but found no trace of the Pope's personal notes. Nothing. Could they have been moved? Perhaps they were never here to begin with. I read that in the testament of Giovanni Paolo II, he had asked that all his documentation be destroyed. Personal, his personal. He said that he in some way did not think it was appropriate to maintain it. Sì, è eh, quella è portata a Cracovia da, da lui. Quindi una, ma una parte è rimasta qua? No. Ha qua, portato i documenti personali? Cracovia, ha portato tutto tutto che, 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 che lui si occupava come se, un suo segretario lo ha portato con sé a Cracovia. Lei non li ha mai potuti consultare questi documenti? Eh, nessuno? Mai, mai. Ma pensa che in quei documenti personali ci possa essere qualcosa che riguarda la scomparsa di Emanuela oppure no? Questo non lo so perché no, 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 non ha avuto mai accesso a questi documenti personali. Mi sembra che era una corrispondenza di, personale di, di Papa Lovitiva. After the death of John Paul II, Don Stanislaw was appointed Archbishop of Krakow in Poland and was thus referred to as Cardinal Zewis. I was determined to reach him. Salve, sono Pietro Orlandi e vorrei parlare per cortesia con il Cardinal Givitz. Sì, mi può chiamare più tardi per cortesia. E verso che ora? Sì, non sono un paio d'ore, ok? Grazie. Ok, grazie a lei. Posta Guosova. Zostaw wiadomość po sygnale. Cardinal Stanislav Dziwic, sono Pietro Orlandi, si ricorderà certamente di me. Sono il fratello di Manuela Orlandi, la cittadina vaticana rapita nel 1983. Papa Francesco ha rivolto un appello al mondo. Costruiamo ponti e abbattiamo i muri. Lo stesso che io chiedo per mia sorella. Spero possa accogliere questa mia richiesta per un incontro privato. Pietro Orlandi. Cardinal Stanislaw Zewis never replied to my email or returned any of my calls. Given the Vatican's enduring silence, my only hope was that someone outside the church might come forward with new information about my sister. 
on September 12, 2005. 22 years after I last saw Emanuela, my prayers were answered. A local news station received a tip that added a whole new dimension to the case of my sister's disappearance. Nella Basilica di Santa Polinare, dove questo signore anonimo ci ha detto andate a vedere, si diceva che fosse stato sepolto appunto Enrico De Pedis, un bandito della banda della Magliana. La Magliana è un quartiere qui di Roma. The newspaper started reporting on Emanuela's case again. And with that, my hope of finding the truth was renewed. La chiesa di Santa Pollinare fu proprio il mio giornale, quello dove lavoravo allora, il messaggero, a scoprire che era sepolto Renatino, ovvero Enrico De Pedis, l'ultimo importante capo della banda della Magliana, prima che questa si consumasse in ammazzamenti vari. Come mai un malavitoso, un uomo ucciso sulla pubblica strada nel 1990 ottiene una sepoltura così incredibile, così altolocata, perché lì non c'è soltanto un sepolcro qualunque nella chiesa di Santa Pollinare. La chiesa di Santa Pollinare è il luogo dove venivano sepolti da secoli soltanto principi, grandi artisti. E poi c'è De Pedis. Enrico De Pedis was the first person to be admitted to the Santa Polinera Cemetery in over a century. What could make this man, a known gangster, worthy of burial alongside the most revered and respected figures in Rome? I demanded that the authorities unearth Enrico De Pedis' tomb to look for clues that might lead to the truth about my sister. But my pleas were ignored. So I turned to the media, who had followed Emanuela's case alongside us, in hopes that public pressure would force a change of heart. Parlato con persone vicine all'andrangheta, alla mafia, alla massoneria, ai servizi. Sono diventato una spugna. Many people expressed solidarity and showed great support in my search for the truth. But the police, the Secret Service, and the Vatican remained silent, just as they had been for over two decades. No one came forth with an official explanation as to why De Pedis' tomb shouldn't be excavated, or why he'd been buried at Santa Polinera's in the first place. And then the authorization had to be from the Vicariato of Rome and from the Minister of the Interior, because that is a particular type of sepulture where is requested the life of the curriculum of the person and the good works that he has done in life. Did you know what good works that he has done, De Pedis, to whom? De Pedis, probabilmente tra tutti i componenti fondatori della banda della Magliana, cioè aveva una testa diversa, aveva una testa e una capacità di interloquire anche con mondi politici, dei servizi e di quant'altro che insomma gli altri forse non avevano. Despite three years of effort, I hadn't been able to convince the authorities to excavate De Pedis' tomb. But on the 25th anniversary of Emanuela's disappearance, a journalist called with an extraordinary story involving De Pedis and a renowned beauty, Sabrina Minardi. In the late 1970s, Minardi was a famous figure in Rome, married to a football superstar Bruno Giordano. 
but in 1982, she created a scandal, leaving Giornardo for De Pedis. And 26 years later, Minardi had gone to the police with an official statement regarding the events of June 22nd, 1983, the day Emanuela went missing. Their report reads, Ministero dell'Interno, Questura di Roma, Squadra Mobile, alla Procura della Repubblica presso il Tribunale di Roma. Pur rimanendo stupita dalla richiesta di De Pedis, Sabrina Minardi porta la ragazza nel posto indicato dove ci sarebbe stata ad attenderla una persona in abito clericale a bordo di un'autovettura Mercedes di colore nero, con vetri oscurati e con una tarca vaticana. Emanuela un po' piangeva, un po' rideva, era come drogata. Chiedeva del fratello. Poi la presero dalla macchina quasi di peso. Precisa richiesta, Sabrina Minardi dichiara che il rapimento di Manuela Orlandi è da ricollegare ai rapporti tra alcuni appartenenti alla cosiddetta banda della Magliana, in particolare il De Pedis e Monsignor Marcincus, all'epoca dei fatti presidente dello IOR. Marcincus. Archbishop Paul Casimir Marcincus, head of the Vatican Bank. I knew this man. He was my boss for many years, starting when the Pope offered me a job at the Vatican Bank on that Christmas Eve of 1983. Marcincus. Quando loro andavano sempre a pregare in giardino, mentre gli altri cardinali, appena li vedevano da lontano, mio padre e mia madre che passavano, deviavano e si allontanavano. Dopo, la, dopo sì. la tragedia? Lui era l'unico che si avvicinava e stava lì con loro, chiacchierava con loro di, di qualunque cosa. Quindi, ripeto, era un grandissimo attore, oppure non c'entra nulla con il sequestro Emanuele. Stupendo per la prima ipotesi. Looking back on that evening when Pope John Paul II offered me a job, I had new questions. Why, of all places in the Vatican, would he want me in the bank? Was it so Marcinkus could keep an eye on me as I fought to uncover the truth about my sister? When I worked at the Vatican Bank, I had no knowledge of the Magliana gang's possible involvement in my sister's abduction, or the connections that De Pedis had with Marcinkus and the Vatican. After 26 years of service, I left the Vatican Bank in 2009. The Vatican's official explanation was early retirement. But in fact, I was pushed out. Perhaps I was getting too close to the truth. I continued to pressure Vatican officials to excavate De Pedis' tomb until finally, in 2012, they agreed. Tre strati, tre teche di rame di zinco, un sarcofago per il corpo di Renatino De Pedis, morto crivellato di colpi in un regolamento di conti e sepolto nella basilica al centro di Roma. 
Abito blu scuro, cravatta dello stesso colore, camicia ingiallita dal tempo e un corpo conservato in perfette condizioni, quello che gli investigatori della scientifica si sono trovati di fronte quando nel cortile della Basilica di Santa Polinare aprono la tomba del boss della Magliana. 29 anni di silenzio, omertà e questo mi ha sempre fatto pensare che, eh, che la verità purtroppo è ancora scomoda per qualcuno. With Tipedi's face plastered all over TV and newspapers, I suddenly made a connection to the first piece of evidence related to my sister's disappearance. The composite drawing described by the traffic patrolman back in 1983 was none other than Enrico de Pedis. I finally knew who had kidnapped my sister. Although no clues related to my sister were found in de Pedis' tomb, it became common knowledge that the Vatican had a business relationship with the Italian Mafia. Shortly after the excavation, the stories began to circulate, describing huge sums of criminal money being laundered by the Vatican Bank. Money that was said to have disappeared. It became frightfully clear that Emanuela's abduction was connected to that money and had nothing to do with Aliaga, the attempted papal assassin. That story was fabricated by the Vatican and the Mafia to divert the public's attention away from the real culprits. And Aliaka was merely a character in their deceptive play. Per uno strano, stranissimo destino, tua sorella è entrato nel meccanismo di quello che Giovanni Falcone chiamava il gioco grande, il gioco grande della storia. Una forte, immensa somma di denaro che era scomparsa e che evidentemente veniva da quel mondo oscuro, criminale e che, come dire, in genere uccidono per i soldi. Questo era il retroscena di questo sequestro, un retroscena che comprensibilmente non poteva emergere in alcun modo, non doveva emergere, perché andava di mezzo appunto l'immagine stessa della Chiesa. If my sister was kidnapped because the Magliana gang wanted their money back from the Vatican Bank, it begs the question, why would the Vatican take these large sums of money in the first place? What did they need that only dirty money could buy? I found the answer to those questions when I got a hold of a document that banker Roberto Galvi had written to Pope John Paul II. In his June 1982 letter, Calvi threatened to expose the Vatican for using stolen gang money to finance a rising liberal Polish trade union, Solidarity, the only one of its kind in the communist Eastern Bloc. One year before my sister disappeared, Calvi writes, Santita. Sono stato io ad addossarmi il pesante fardello degli errori, nonché delle colpe commesse dagli attuali e precedenti rappresentanti dello IOR. Sono proprio molti coloro che vorrebbero sapere da me se ho fornito mezzi economici a Solidarnosc o anche armi e finanziamenti ad altre organizzazioni di paesi dell'Est. Santità, a lei mi rivolgo perché solo attraverso il suo alto intervento è ancora possibile respingere il terribile spettro di un'immane sciagura. Grato nel bacio del Sacro Anello, mi confermo della santità vostra. Roberto Calvi. Twelve days later, Calvi was found dead in London's Thames River. 
Il banchiere è stato assassinato fra le 19 e le 22 di giovedì 17 corrente ed è stato appeso dagli assassini mediante la stessa fune con la quale è stato strangolato ad una impalcatura metallica sotto il lato nord del ponte di Blackfriars sul Tamigi mentre vi era l'alta marea. Pope John Paul II was using mafia money to fight communism. It may have been a good cause, but his actions were illegal and dangerous. And he chose to protect himself. In the end, my sister was sacrificed on the altar of the Cold War to expedite the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 2016, more secrets seeped through the Vatican walls. I learned that the Vatican State and the Italian government had been quietly negotiating over my sister's case. Journalist Gianlu Genucci had access to the discussions. We have, on one hand, the state Italian. On the other hand, we have two del Vaticano. The Vatican State, Vatican and Italy, who meet together because perché c'è una trattativa, una trattativa vuol dire che qualcuno offre qualcosa e l'altro c'è un baratto. Da una parte il Vaticano avrebbe dato un dossier su tua sorella, con delle verità dentro, dall'altra parte avrebbe chiesto alla procura di traslare la salma di Renatino De Pedis sepolto a Santa Polinare. Perché? Perché crea imbarazzo. It was now clear why the Vatican allowed De Pedis' tomb to be excavated in 2012. The Italian government agreed to move De Pedis' body out of the Vatican, and the Vatican, in exchange, would share information about Emanuela's disappearance. But where is that information? What happened to my sister? In light of this new information, I filed an official complaint through one of Rome's top lawyers, Laura Sugoro. Al comandante del corpo della gendarmeria dello Stato Città del Vaticano. Le fonti consultate riferiscono dell'esistenza di una trattativa avvenuta anche nel territorio dello Stato della Città del Vaticano tra la fine del 2011 e i primi mesi del 2012. Risulta quanto mai necessario che la Città dello Stato Vaticano apra un'indagine sulla scomparsa di Manuela Orlandi e che chiarisca definitivamente ogni circostanza che vede coinvolta la Santa Sede in questa tristissima vicenda. Con osservanza, 21 novembre 2017. Questo ultimo fatto della trattativa, secondo me, è il, il fatto più importante accaduto in 34 anni. Certo, il fatto ancora più importante è che questa trattativa non sia di fatto mai stata smentita da nessuno. Quindi il silenzio da parte di entrambi non fa altro che avvalorare il contenuto di quanto è emerso. Quindi è necessario a questo punto che il Vaticano possa spiegare di questa trattativa e di tutte le incongruenze che ci sono state in questi anni. Anche perché Emanuele è cittadina vaticana. Our carefree and peaceful existence within the walls of the smallest state in the world is now a distant memory. For Emanuela, the privilege of being born a Vatican citizen would become a sentence of doom. And a tainted legacy that would deprive us of the truth. A truth that has only become more incomprehensible as the years pass. On April 27, 2014, Pope John Paul II was canonized. In the eyes of the Vatican, he was a saint. I believe that Pope Francis, like his predecessors, knows Emanuela's fate. 35 years have passed since my sister was taken from us. Since then, my citizenship to the Vatican City was revoked when I married an outsider. 
I was forced to retire early from the Vatican Bank. I have asked too many questions that the Vatican does not want to answer. I am now unwelcome within the walls that once surrounded my happy childhood. But the pain I feel for my sister is stronger than the Vatican's resistance. The barricades to the truth that surrounded my family in this state where my father devoted his life to the Pope must fall. Now there is an official complaint implicating the state authorities in Emanuela's disappearance. They must take responsibility and tell us what they know. This time, there will be no secret negotiations. I will find the truth. I will bring justice to my sister.